Okay, so um, thank you everyone who's watching uh, for joining me again for a Meet the Maker Artist interview as part of the Bristol and Bloom Appalachian Regional Art Festival. Um, I, my name is Marcy Parks, if you haven't, um, if you don't know me already, but I'm interviewing all of the artists that are participating in the Bristol and Bloom Festival coming up on Saturday, August 8th of this year. So with me now is Richard Graves. Um, Richard, thank you again so much for joining me and for um, not only participating in the festival, but also being a huge supporter of the festival and um, also for joining me for this interview. Um, Absolutely. My, my pleasure. This is fun. Cool. So um, if you want to, can you go ahead and just, for people who don't know you, um, just tell a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, and um, how you got to be an artist now doing what you're doing now. Sure. Yeah. And of course, that's a loaded question and a long, <laughs> a long story, but I'll just try to try to jump into it. So I'm from Atlanta, G Georgia, originally, and I went to college at Emory and Henry and fell in love with the area, fell in love with the community and moved back here about 10 years to uh, start my career as a broadcast journalist. Um, I was the manager of WEHC 90.7, the um, public radio station out of Emory and Henry College that covers um, five counties and is a 9,000 watt station and does NPR and locally sourced um, talk and music. But this is a um, kind of a weird transitional year for me. It's a weird year for everyone. <laughs> um, but this year I've actually decided to step away from that career and pursue art um, full time. I've been doing it on the side and trying to actively promote myself as an artist in this region. I've been doing that for about two years. And um, I figured it was time where I took the leap, so to speak, and uh, transition into doing it full time and seeing what kind of opportunities would be available, you know, as the world, the world changes. So this will be uh, the second half of this year, starting in likely July will be my first time as a uh, full time artist uh, relying on work to to pay my rent yes that's so awesome and i'm so excited for you um for taking those steps um so yeah i'm definitely going to be cheering for you from the sidelines and <laughs> um definitely pushing for your um success but thank you yeah so one thing that um I really wanted to talk to you about, well, first, I'm just going to share my screen so people can get an idea of the work that you're doing. So um, can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is, I've got your Instagram pulled up now. Um, and it seems like, are you probably, would you say you're the most active on Instagram? Yeah, I, I would say so. That's probably at least the most regular. That's probably the, be the best place to follow me. I try to update that at least every day or every two days. Cool. Well, what I love are all these portraits that you're doing. And um, what I love also is that your style just has such an energetic quality and expressive quality in itself. And so you've got these portraits which which already feature, you know, varying expressions, but then combined with your style just captures such an energy and presence. Um, and so it's really fun to see all these faces, um, most of people that I don't even know, um, but it's just really cool to see these faces because some of them, I'm just like this one, I love this face. I don't know who this person is, but I love their face and the way you've captured it. Um, yeah, thank you. It's actually wonderful hearing you talk about it. I'm, I'm extremely flattered. Um, yeah, I've always gravitated more towards portraiture and figure drawing. I love landscapes. I love abstracts. But all other things equal um, for me and a lot of people that view art, that's the easiest way to catch my attention is to have a face, someone that I can identify with. Um, so that's why nudes, figure drawing, portraiture, something where there's a human connection um, in it. So even when it is something like, for instance, la landscapes, I always like when there's some type of sense of humanity, if not an actual figure um, in the painting somewhere, that there's some type of relatable kind of experience that gives me an entry point in as a viewer for something that I'm looking at. 
Um, and then in particular, lately, I've especially gravitated towards portraitures because I've done a lot of um, commissions and I've met a lot of other artists online, especially now in the, the time of COVID, um, where online presence for artists and online community is even more important. I've met a lot that are willing to share reference photos, share tips and tricks. And a lot of the people I'm drawing and a lot of these are folks that have just volunteered their likeness to be used by artists. Um, so I see almost every piece. It's exciting for me because it almost makes every piece collaborative if I'm working off someone else's likeness. And sometimes I'm more faithful to that and other times I use it as like a very, very rough guide. And I always try to put several elements in each piece that are completely um, original and you know wouldn't be found or wouldn't be as um, prominent in whatever reference photo or original, um, original piece or photograph or sometimes even live uh, figure drawing that I'm using for my reference. Yeah, so with images so most of your portraits i know you're saying you're connecting with a lot of artists online um so with a lot of these portraits are they people that you know are they people that are just sharing i know there's like an app or something that you've been you shared with me in the past that you've um connected with people through in order to create their portraits is that right yeah it's all different so sketchy is a portraiture app that essentially kind of works like Instagram. And I've really gravitated towards that because it's a good community where I've met a lot of people and I've also gotten a good bit of commissions through it. That piece on the screen now is um, someone who, I believe they actually don't create too much art, but have an account just to post reference pictures for other artists to use. Um, so it's essentially like Instagram where you you can post your art, but you can also upload inspiration for other people to use. Um, so a lot of times I try to find reference photos that other artists aren't drawing or that I think people might particularly find um, interesting so where I can um, you know, do something for someone else if I'm just gonna be sketching or practicing anyway, use, um, use a photograph that someone would appreciate that they shared with the intention of an artist using with all the permissions for an artist to use and be experimental with likeness and some look nothing like the person and sometimes I feel bad if I don't capture their likeness or take it a different direction but people in that particular community and other online communities I found are very great gracious with sharing sharing their likeness um, that's also a great way to not have to worry about um, you know, accidentally using someone's likeness or having to find stock photos, I have permission to to use and sell art based off some of the reference photos. So it's kind of a, just a treasure trove of portraiture with um, you know a lot of a lot of diversity and a lot of some of its camera phone pictures, some of its professional pho photographers. There's kids with accounts, all different kinds of folks. So there's a lot of diversity of just us as humans to be able to draw from as resor resources and references. Yeah, so it's really, like you said, just a treasure trove of inspiration, especially for someone who, you know, does um, specialize or is drawn to portraiture and figure drawing. Um, and like you said, you know, now in the digital age, it's such a slippery slope and tricky um, road to sort of navigate when it comes to copyright infringement and um, honoring those, um, you know, somebody's intellectual property. So the fact that you have permission to be able to use these photos for your references and um, have that creative license is really, really beneficial um, and really awesome. Absolutely. And um, in turn, I've had to get out of my comfort zone and model for other people too. Yes! Um, and I don't think that's necessary for artists to do to also model but I think for me and the way I approach it it was I didn't want to constantly be using other people's likenesses using using them for reference without be, being willing to pose myself and in a way getting over my vanity too of being comfortable <laughs> with no matter whatever someone's talent level because I'll trade portraits with people that are um, you know 
younger kids on the app or people that aren't professionals and then with professional artists as well, kind of having to loosen my expectations of, I might not look great in some of these, both you know, stylistically or my likeness might, get, might not get captured in a flattering way and I kind of have to prepare myself for that. But it's, if I was you know, being a part of that dynamic on one side as an artist, I wanted to make sure I understood the issues from the other perspective as too. So that's been, been interesting having to be a little more vulnerable in ways I hadn't been in my life before. Well, I think it's um, beneficial in a lot of ways, you know, as an artist capturing people's likenesses, you have an idea of um, what works when it comes to or what makes it not necessarily easier because I'm sure it's everything has its own challenges, but you know, um, sort of what positions, I guess you could even say that you like to draw people in and so so on and so forth, or what makes an interesting composition when looking at someone um, or images that you're drawn to. And so as an artist who's also modeling for people, you can sort of create some really interesting compositions and interesting images that, that too would make interesting compositions for people that are drawing them. Um, Absolutely, and I think it's made me a stronger artist in a lot of ways too, because when I'm um, modeling for someone, I try to think about how can I, you know, make a lot of really dynamic and different angles to give people more options, you know, so a lot of times I'll kick my knee up in a way that might be very unnatural, you know, <laughs> if I were just sitting, sitting across from each other having a chat, but then, you know, when I go back to that, as an artist, I'm finding myself looking for those angles in different ways and trying to kind of think about what were they trying to communicate with that piece or with their body language or with their expression. And is that going to be the same objective that I'm going to be trying to do with this piece? And very often, you know, when I start a piece and where I finish and what I'm to kind of trying to communicate between that changes dramatically, as I'm sure it does for a lot of people, but it's made me a lot more intentional about that, that process. And I've also tried to do some journaling around it too. And, um, you know, for me, draw, uh, drawing a lot of other people, whether they be strangers or sometimes celebrities or fan art, I feel like I have just a much stronger connection with both the individual people, but with also just like humanity in general. Um, and that's just, kind of something that I didn't expect from it is I don't think I've I've done tons of sketches and abstracts that I don't remember but I feel like every person that I've ever drawn or painted to any degree I have I almost miss them even if I know nothing about their life I think about them like I hope they're still doing well when I don't know if they were doing well to begin with I feel like it's you know it's one of those ways I feel like art asks and demands a lot of empathy from people but you know adding portraiture and kind of building these relationships of making art from someone's likeness adds just a whole new dynamic to that that's something that I it has helped me grow as a, a person and something I've really appreciated exploring lately. Well I really love that um, what you said about it connect have developing this connection with humanity because really you know so much is expressed through a person's face and through their eyes and so when you're connecting with these images of people you know it's not just a person's face and i mean in a sense of like it's not just like i think it would be easy to get caught up in like anatomy like okay here are the eye sockets whatever uh, and sort of yeah. that sort of thing but you know there's a lot more that's being translated through somebody's expression, you know, um, their feelings, um, just the, you know, you can say like so much can be told about a person through their eyes and you, there's a whole story there in a person's face. And so I think you do that really beautifully um, with the colors and the way that you illustrate um, and the way you capture those portraits. And like you said, you know, using your creative license to take it a little bit further or, you know, even trying to get closer to the image, you do a really great job of catching and capturing this sort of um, emotional intensity in the 
in your portraits. Um, and I don't want to mean, and I don't mean like emotional intensity in terms of extreme emotional expression, but just that there's, it's really felt um, whenever you look at your, your art, there's definitely something felt and experienced. Thank um, you. That means a lot because that's exactly what I'm going for. As much as I'm illustrating a person in their likeness, I see it more as illustrating their interior, spiritual, emotional life. And I don't think it has to be or should be spelled out, but I try to. And sometimes I have those narratives explicit in my head when I'm doing it. And other times I'm trying to kind of tie into universal anxieties and universal emotions, but that's kind of the heart of what I'm trying to do. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you say that because that's what I'm hoping people get out of it. Cool. Yeah. And there is, um, I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, there are just, I feel like with every image I see, I immediately start to tell a story in my head. Um, about their background or whatever, um, maybe like what kind of day they've had and so on. So yeah, I think you do that really successfully. And I love the pet portraits. So let's talk about that. Um, that's something that you've been doing as well are these adorable pet portraits, which I think you capture the, I mean, every pet is sweet to me. So <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say you capture the gentleness and sweetness of every dog um, and cat. But yeah, so talk a little bit about the pet portraits you've been doing. Um, I know people can commission those from you, right? Yes, and um, my contact information is on the website. And if anyone wants to um, get in touch with me about that, I love doing, doing the pet portraits. They can be really difficult sometimes. Um, that's a whole other dynamic too. Um, but those you know, make great gifts. People love it. You know, that's just one to have a pet portrait on your wall just means the world to people. I know it's meant the meant the world to me. Um, so that's something that has been very popular and something that I, I love to do. Um, and they make, make great gifts. Um, I try to keep my art pretty affordable. And with the pet portraits in particular, I price those price them to sell because I very much enjoy doing them. That's for, that one was for my mom for Christmas. Oh my God. The best Christmas present. That is so cute. I love it. Um, we're actually yeah. in Christmas. A lot of these were Christmas commissions. Uh, yeah. From where we are here. Um, but yeah, I, I'm happy to talk to anyone about my pet portraits. I love, love doing those. And um, it's definitely been something that's resonated with a lot of folks. Yeah. I love the line work that you did with this one. And that's another artist that I've never met in person. Her name is uh, Deb Manley. And we met through that sketchy app and I've been a follower and fan of hers. And um, I've even taken online classes with some of the folks, but that's um, that one particular one, um, that portrait of Deb is an example of just another artist that I never would have met or crossed paths with. Um, I think they live in the UK actually. Oh, cool. Um, but that's one example of how that's opened a door for like a much larger global community in art, yeah. in addition to having this wonderful community here in Southwest Virginia, East Tennessee. Yeah, but it is great. You know, um, that's something that Brian and I, Brian and I had been discussing, dis discussing, discussing earlier, um, just how artists in the digital age, you know, you have this wealth of resources um, and, you know, be, the internet can be sort of, a gift and a curse in that way. You have this um, unlimited resource of different artists that, you know, you can be inspired by and connect with, or you can, you know, potentially be intimidated by um, and have a hard time sort of differentiating yourself from. Um, so yeah, it's just really great that you've been able to find um, community in this space and not only community, but creative inspiration as well. Um, so that's really awesome. Yeah. So something else that I wanted to um, talk about is the award you recently won for your um, Dr. Ford piece. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was a huge honor. And that was around the time where I was trying to decide if it was going to be possible to kind of eventually make this transition. I was starting to get a few more successful shows under my belt. I was feeling a little more confident, get, getting some more 
regular work. So that was a big symbolic win, but also I had known about the uh, Fletcher exhibit and the Fletcher family, um, you know, for years, this is an annual event. So to even be included in the show at the Reese Museum um, was a huge honor. Um, and then when I was at the, the art talk um, that was given by Sue Ko, who's an artist I've been familiar with for years, I think I found Sue Ko, who was the juror for the event. She had done Talking Heads posters in the 80s. Um, but when she, I got the Reese Museum Award for, for that particular piece, that was definitely one of the best milestones I've had. Um, so far, that one was one that was honestly one of the easiest ones I've did. I kind of sat down and did it about one sitting a few days um, after the Kavanaugh um, hearing and that was just exactly what I had in my mind and exactly how I felt and I I try not to I don't want to over explain that one I feel like my my feelings about the event are pretty clearly communicated um, with that piece um, but that one was was one that I felt was almost more more important especially at the time you know there was a big national conversation about what does this mean for our society? It felt much bigger than it did, um, than it was just those people in the room. It felt like it was about how we treat women, how we, how we as a society um, really just treat people. Um, and a lot of my work is called political and I call it political sometimes, but I really don't consider myself a political artist in the sense that nothing, I'm no expert, none of my pieces speak to policy or plans. You know, my interest um, in politics kind of starts and stops um, at the fundamental qu question of how should people be treated and how do we as a society treat those people. So my really only interest with politics is when it's viewed through that lens, but I think most of our issues that are considered political issues can and should be viewed through the lens of how do we treat people. Um, so that was kind of the approach that I took um, really whenever I'm doing anything political or current events, but in particular with, um, with thinking about those Kavanaugh hearings and also thinking what it was like digesting that with a lot of students being on a college campus at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think with that piece in particular, it's so evocative. Um, and yeah, again, not to over explain it, but just there's this haunting quality. And I think looking, especially now, sort of looking back on that piece, um, you know, that haunting quality is even more present just because of how everything sort of played out. Um, and yeah, I just feel like what you're doing by cre be being bold enough to create work like that and make those statements, I feel like that is a lot what art is about. Not necessarily being, um, it's just in provoking people to think and to feel things and to question things, right? So whether it's an overt or yeah overtly political piece like that that's you know really calling attention to a certain time place and um event or you know something and i think about like with abstract paintings like with the work that i do you know a lot of it is um trying to get people to um not necessarily well yeah in a way sort of feel things um, feel things or think things or question things that they might otherwise not experience or might be, you know, overlooking or even um, ignoring in a lot of ways. So um, in that sense, I feel like all art on some level is political in that, um, not necessarily in terms of like, um, right or left or Republican or Democrat or whatever, but political in that it's really challenging people to um, listen to themselves and question things. Absolutely. I, I agree. And I feel like, I think you hit the nail on the head too, even if it's not explicit. I feel like all art is 
political in the sense that it challenges us to think about others, think about the world around us, to think about the world and society we live in. I think all of it does that, um, whether, whether explicitly or not. Yeah, absolutely. So um, otherwise, now I want you to, um, can you just describe sort of where your art practice is now? I know you shared that you're sort of working towards um, doing this as your full-time gig, um, which is really exciting, but just um, incorporating. So for example, I know oh, early on, it seemed like you started out primarily in um, gouache and watercolor, and now you've really started to incorporate even digital art into your paintings as well. So can you just describe some of your process, what that looks like, um, what kind of tools are you using, and that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really in and out of digital. I learned, um, I started doing digital about a year and a half ago, and it really opened things up for me, both to be able to edit original pieces to provide more affordable prints to folks um, what was a huge resource, but also to be able to do more design and just have different tools at my belt. And I think work in a digital medium helped me think about traditional materials differently. I'm really excited to use the time of being a full-time artist to have time to experiment too. Um, so I would like to do more oils. I would like to, I'm, I'm going to be using a crown melter. Have you used a crown melter before? No. <laughs> I'm excited to do that. And I was looking to see if there's some like artisan professional um, brand or anything, but I just got a Crayola crown maker that's a <laughs> five, and up, five and up. And there was actually um, a local artist that inspired me to do that out oblivion. Um, had a had a few pieces in some local shows, and I saw that I get a lot of my inspiration from from local folks. But I'm going to be trying a lot more. I'm going to try to work a whole lot bigger too. So that's going to be that's going to be a challenge. But I'm going to be using the time as I'm figuring out what's next and how to approach it to also try new material. Um, so I'm going to continue to stick with watercolor being my go-to. I'm most comfortable that with that, but branch out to uh, more materials and work in different uh, methods as well. So I'm hoping everything I do will look completely different, you know, every few months. Um, and I always appreciate people that are constantly pushing themselves to work on in ever changing styles you know you're a good example of that where you'll do the you know the prince of myth the goddesses of myth and then have a series of abstract paintings and then the mixed media with the stitching i want and almost feel like i kind of need to push myself out of the comfort zone but still have some staples that i'm doing consistently so watercolor is what i'm most comfortable with and i will not give that up but i'm going to be trying to work bigger and in in more varied materials in the next year yeah that's really awesome i'm excited to see that work and what comes from that um, me too me too but, <laughs> but that's something um that's come up in these interviews that i've done so far also is um just this willingness to go out and develop your skills and experiment on your own um, and that's something you and I have also spoken about um, in our own exchanges is just this quality of Appalachian artists to, um, you know, teach themselves and to learn things on their own. And so it sounds like you're getting ready to do, you know, a lot of that, um, just some self-study and experimenting with new materials. So, and I think it's important for people to hear that and to hear about these artists that, you know, are um, by pretty much every definition, you know, successful in making it, to hear that, you know, they're also still going out and teaching themselves new things um, that you don't necessarily need to get a formal education in order to actually be an artist. Um, right. You don't even have to actually sell artwork to be an artist, right? It's it's really just that creative endeavor um, 
And I'm so glad you made that distinction because it's so easy to talk about in, in terms of being successful or making it. But I, and I have to tell myself this, so I'm talking as much to myself right now as I'm talking to you, but there's no way to fail as an artist. Of course, yeah. there are certain milestones. If I'm using this to support myself, I need to make enough money to pay my rent. But, you know, if I'm to fall short on that or have to, you know, look for another part-time job or something, that's not failing as an artist. I right. think being an artist is completely un, untied and untethered to that commercial s success. I do have goals for starting the business and for supporting myself and, you know, those things that I am hoping to reach and exceed. But the actual being an artist thing is not something that I could see failing at if I'm doing it authentically, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, and I had shared this with Summer when I did, you know, an interview on her show, Art Talk, um, for the radio. I, art, being an artist is as much a lifestyle mm -hmm. to me. It's not so much like I'm an artist because I've sold paintings or I do this as a job or whatever, because I don't do it as a full-time job, but you know, I'm an artist because I create things and um, I feel like everybody on some level is an artist. They just, for some of us, it's, we connect with it and we actively, you know, explore and share that part of ourselves. And some of us haven't quite gotten to that point where we can connect with that part of ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, absolutely. One of the things I'm hoping to make is more of a long-term goal and still do, uh, do a lot with in the near future too is youth outreach and uh, youth engagement. That's one of the reasons why I'm real excited for, for Bloom in Bristol. But I also know for me how important it was to meet artists when I was a kid and how much that meant to me. And when I say artist as a kid, I mean professional artists but I had um, a guy that was a, a, checkout, um, a checkout clerk at a grocery store when I was like seven or eight, and they did a doodle on a receipt and said, this is how I draw my eyes. They gave it to me. That was the coolest thing I ever, ever received. And where I've, um, you know, we had a drink a draw at Bloom um, a couple months ago, and one of them had a lot more kids come to it than I was expecting. And it was an absolute blast to <laughs> interact and to see all of the, you know, artists that were closer to my generation, like looking over their shoulder to see what they were doing. And I see that as um, both a way to give back, um, but also as something that energizes me is to, you know, try to see and develop and nurture talent um, in younger artists too. And Hopefully, like I wish I had pursued it earlier and I wish I had had art as a career framed differently to me as a high schooler or even as a college student than I did. So I would like to kind of change the way we talk about art. Um, and I think a big part of that is going to happen specifically in this region. Several people ask me, oh, are you going to go to move here, or move there, they have great art scenes. And I've been like, no, like that might change later on, but I see this place as having a, a big cultural shift for artists and this being a good community and a good network where not just I can be an artist here, but it benefits me too. I'm making connections. You know, People like you are a big part of that. People that have the vision to build a festival like Bloom in Bristol or to organize artist meetups or drink and draws. I'm finding a lot of uh, venue owners, um, people that own breweries and coffee shops like Elder Brew and Bloom and Cascade Draft House. They're starting to encourage and promote art at those places. Um, I think this, uh, the culture of having more pop-up art shows and non-traditional venues I think we're doing a disservice to uh, kids that are um, wanting, showing interest in art and we say, oh, you go to grad school and you submit to galleries and this is how you do it. And then at the end of this line, you're, you're at auction at Sotheby's or Christie's. And that's not the case. That's not realistic. Most people with um, 
you know, that are pursuing arts aren't doing it the same way as anyone, much less kind of some plotted course. So while that's a piece of the puzzle for everyone, I think the arts community specifically here is getting a lot more inclusive and has a, have a lot more people that are willing to make connections, work together as a community and think outside the box of where do we want to see this grow? So I see it as a very exciting time for everyone, the people that live here, the artists, the people who want to buy art. I feel like this will be one of the first um, economies and cultures to rebound um, as the world heals and completely changes. I see it as, as a great time to be an artist when people are going to be hungry for that connection, hungry for those conversations and really hungry for that community too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like um, that was, you know, that was one thing or one reason that I wanted to start Bristol and Bloom is just because so many artists that I grew up with um, and were close to and really had a lot of respect for and that were really talented, a lot of them were leaving. Um, Pretty much everyone that I grew up with that was really talented has moved to a different state, a bigger city where, you know, there's just more opportunity. And um, I really just wanted to start the festival in order to do like what you were saying, you know, first of all, just connect with kids um, and show them that, you know, there are tons of artists here and that you can make great art here and you can also make a living as being an artist here and to create a network and community where other artists connect, can connect with other artists and just, um, you know, learn from one another, share, share tools of, or tricks of the trade. And, um, you know, I wanted the festival to be as much of like a reunion event where people could come and celebrate, artists could come and celebrate together but also for the community to connect with artists and artists from our region and just, because art has this way of telling a story about a region and a culture, right? So just like your Dr. Ford piece tells a story about the times that we've been living through in, the, um, in recent years, you know, art has a way of communicating a lot of things about a community. And um, Appalachia has a unique story and identity to tell. And so, and we all see it through a different way. Um, and we all have that story to tell, but we tell it in our own voice. Um, and so I think it's, you know, I love what you've said about connecting with youth and having that outreach and nurturing, you know, that creative spirit in people from this area. And the fact that you have the, the resiliency to want to stay here and make it in this area. Because I think that's also important too, is, um, you know, pouring back into the community that also has sort of brought you up in a way. Um, so yeah, that's really awesome. And I think people are hungry for that. You know, a lot of what I was talking about has been directly inspired from our work on Bloom and Bristol, but to think about how it's grown from the idea that you had to 70 artists, food trucks, education, live painting, interviews, the connections with other educational institutions, for just year one, and I know it's been something you've been working on for a lot longer than that, but for yeah. year one to get to that get to that place from when you started to have the website and actively promoting it um, to now having to retool it in a crisis and change the date, I think that shows <laughs> that, that people are hungry for it and it is resonating with people and it hasn't even happened for the first time yet, but right. that's, the opportunity to grow and not knowing exactly how it'll grow, but to know that that opportunity and that potential is there and that people are ready for something like that. I told someone about it um, today when I was, when I was on campus, there was someone walking from a distance and I was telling them about the festival to see their eyes light up. They're like, well, why haven't we had that? That's a great idea. And like, well, no one's done it, but Marcy's put this together and it resonated with people and other people got on board. That goes to show that, that there's a need for it in this area, um, both for the artists, but for the, for the community as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, well, I mean, it's, this especially has just showed me like 
how necessary and important community is because you know though i've been putting this together and doing a lot of the work none of it could be happening without you all participating and without the support um that i've received and so you know that's another reason why i have so much faith in our community to um to support people, to support artists, and to support their their visions for themselves, you know? Um, so I just, I really appreciate you, especially just because you've been so supportive this whole time and you've done so much to help me make those connections in order to, you know, promote it with people and to, um, to get the word out for people to know about it. So I super appreciate that. Yeah, well, thank you. But it's, uh, yeah, it's an exciting, it's an exciting and strange, but exciting time for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a great way to describe it. Um, so last question I want to ask is just, so with, and this is kind of the question I'm asking everybody is just about Appalachian art. And we've already kind of touched on it a bit, but what does that definition mean for you? What does that look like? Um, do you identify as an Appalachian? Appalachian artist and what does that mean for you? Sure. Um, the wording I use on like website and stuff, as I say, from the Wolf Hills of Virginia, because um, I think that sounds really cool. Um, <laughs> that's, I love that kind of connection to place and the history. But the other the other label I've used for myself that other people use is Neo Appalachian artist. Um, and some of the, again, this is just my own definition of the word, but I see it as having that close connection to community and place. I see it, you know, the Neo is kind of making that distinction that there are some wonderful traditional Appalachian crafts and arts in this area, but there is also a lot of new and innovative ideas and things that look completely night and day different when you think of Appalachian art or some of the things that's promoted or what's thought of outside of this region. I think it speaks to the diversity of art that's being made here, but also the diversity of people making that art, um, which would also be, I think, surprising to, to some other folks. Um, for me, Neo-Appalachian art also means that I try to make it affordable. I think everyone should be able to afford art in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it should be something that only people with um, insane wealth are able to own. I think art should be affordable. It should be accessible, both the, the education and the actual physical physical art. I see Neo-Appalachian as a, as a promise to try to keep it, keep it affordable and to work, work within people's means for people that are willing to support you. And I also see it as being... Um, an area and a culture that will facilitate the non-traditional spaces. So being a Neo-Appalachian artist, I would say the same thing in a gallery as I would in a brewery or at a bar. Um, I think some, sometimes the more non-traditional the venue, the, the better it is um, for meeting people because it also goes back to meeting people where they are and to think, and to think less traditionally about what it could be. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Hey, Searsha. Searsha just got home. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tell her but, some hello, please. Yeah, I will. Um, well, so I definitely agree with you about, you know, art being affordable and accessible to people. And um, yeah, I really appreciate the work that you're doing to keep that um, and to make it accessible for people. Um, so before we and I did just want to share one more time on my screen. Um, so I've got your Instagram pulled up so people can find you here on Instagram at Sir Pounce. Um, and then I wanted to show your Etsy shop as well. So Richard Graves Art is where people can come to find um, all your prints that are available. So um, you've got that listed here. There's the Dr. Ford piece, which I love. Um, so just wanted to make sure people have that. And when I share the video, um, I'm going, and here's your Facebook page as well. So anybody who wants to keep up with you will have those things. Um, so I will share with the video your Instagram links, Facebook links, and the link to your Etsy shop so that anybody who's interested can connect with you there. Um, Absolutely. One other thing I want to mention to folks, because I'm kind of being told and everything I read, the mailing list is really important. So I'm trying to grow <laughs> yeah. my mailing list. 
um, richardgravesart.com. I'm also trying very hard not to spam people or update too much. So I'm not doing it any more than once, once a month. Um, so I send it out pretty infrequently, but try to include a lot of updates and package it real easily since I'm sending that directly to folks that want to follow me. So you can sign up just by typing your email address at my website, richardgravesart.com. Okay, cool. Then I will definitely. That's my, that's my, one of my immediate goals is growing that mailing list so I can yeah. be able to communicate with people directly. I'm just going to write that down and I'll make sure to include that link as well. Um, for people that want to connect with you, but I appreciate you again so much for participating, for sharing your time, taking the time to do this interview with me um, again, for being such a huge proponent and supporter of the Bristol and Bloom Art Festival and for participating in the festival. Um, again, none of it could happen without community. And I just am so thankful to have you as part of mine. Well, right, right back at you. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful. And hopefully sooner rather than later, we can meet up again. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yep. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank yeah, you so much. It. Thank you. I'll see you later. All right. Bye.